important scientists and inventors in history, and certainly in the history of this country, was an immigrant from Yugoslavia called Tesla. Tesla. The problem with Tesla is he's not as well known as Thomas Edison or George Westinghouse or the other inventors of the era, and he's not well known for a couple of reasons. One of which is he never founded a company like Westinghouse or Edison or, or, or something like that. He never, he never made an industry or a corporation. He was a germaphobe. He was terrified of microbes and things like this, and he was extremely eccentric. But also, he was somebody who had a brilliant mind for science, but he couldn't explain his science mathematically. He's most known, well, he's known for a lot of things among scientists, but Edison liked DC, direct current. Tesla liked alternating current, AC. Tesla's problem was when they were trying to put the electrical systems into cities like New York and Paris and London, the, the two ideas were competing. Mr. Tesla had no way to, ex to quantify it, to explain it mathematically. In fact, it was some time later, after Mr. Tesla, that a, a German Jewish mathematician, an electrophysicist, and a political philosopher, his name was Steinitz, came along. And what Steinitz did was something nobody else ever thought to do. He put a right triangle inside of a circle. Scientists and engineers had always used calculus to explain physics. Nobody ever thought to use geometry to explain physics in any significant way until this guy Steinitz came along trying to see how you could possibly explain alternating current. So we put this right triangle inside of a circle and he had the hypotenuse rotating. And that would be how many cycles it was. How many cycles it was. So he was able to figure out a way to mathematically calculate the way alternating current would work. That was because of Steinitz, this German Jewish guy. It was as much a political philosopher as he was a scientist. But that's what he was and that's what he did. Somebody had to come along and explain how it works after the fact. But what would happen if there was no frequency? What would happen if the current oscillated and it was inconsistent? Now you've got a real problem because you can't mathematically quantify it. Well, the return of Jesus is the same thing. We know what's happening, but you can't quantify it mathematically down to the point where you'd set a date for his return. You know what's happening, but it's futile to try to set a date for his return, even though, foolishly, many people have tried to do it, and undoubtedly many more are going to try. In the last days, we're going to see more people doing this thing, this nonsense of trying to work out the day of his return. All you know is the way it's going. You can't quantify it because it's inconsistent. There is no consistency in the variable. It's just too inconsistent. Well, let's understand something. Turn with me, please, to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. What we see in verse 12, he reiterates what we see in verse 10. The elements, and I've explained this before, the stoichia, the stoichia, get the word stoichiometry, elemental chemistry on the periodic chart, gram atomic weight and all that. The elements will be dissolved with intense heat. Now obviously, the Greeks knew about elements. They knew about atoms. They had the word atoms, atmos, that which is indivisible. But they did not know an element could be dissolved. In fact, before Einstein, nobody ever really thought an element could be dissolved. A stoichia was indissolvable. 
an atom meant that which is indivisible to the Greeks, couldn't get any smaller. They didn't know about subatomic particles, they didn't know about neutrons or protons or electrons or neutrinos or positrons or quarks, they had no idea. But it is indeed impressive that a fisherman from Galilee nearly 2,000 years ago not only said that elements can be dissolved, but they can be dissolved in significant enough quantity to destroy the biosphere. Now that's exactly what it says in Greek. That's exactly what it says in the Greek language. The elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Well, how did Peter know about critical mass or how did Peter know before there was uranium-238 or plutonium? How did he know this? I don't know, but that is exactly what it says. That is exactly what it says. And it doesn't give much scope for interpretation. It's pretty direct as to what it says. The, the stoichia are going to be dissipated with, with fire. Um, now, what else anybody could make of it, I don't know. But that's exactly what it literally says in the Greek language. That the elements will be dissolved with fire. Something that the Greeks considered to be indissolvable was going to be dissolved and the biosphere would be destroyed that way. But because we're going to see these things happen, looking for and hastening the coming. Hastening the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus is curious. Nobody can know the day of his return except the Father. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't know the day of his return. He may know now in heaven, but he certainly didn't know when he was here. Why? Because it's a variable. It is a variable. It says in Luke's Gospel, quoting Jesus, when the crop permits, hmm. when the crop permits, the Lord of the harvest will send the harvesters. Hmm. We are not waiting for Jesus to come back. He's waiting for us to be ready. He's waiting for us to be ready. Uh, it's when the crop permits. Jesus is not coming back simply when the Father permits. He's coming back when the crop permits. When the full number of the elect have been saved. Now there are varying aspects of this. One is the time of the Gentiles, as we read about in Luke 21, 24, and as we read about in Romans 11, 25. A time will come when the full harvest of the nations of the non-Jewish world will have come to salvation under grace. The church, the faithful church, will be removed and God will again turn his purposes back to Israel and the Jews eschatologically during a very dark hour of human history and the darkest hour of Jewish history, the Great Tribulation. He'll turn his grace back. Well, part of the reason it is, the crop permits, is when the Gentile church has finished its work. But when is that? Well, we don't know. We just know when the crop permits. He's going to separate out the wheat from tares at some point. But the crop permits. Quite a task. Let the wheat and tares grow up together, Jesus said. One of the ways the church first went wrong, and I've explained this in a couple of my books, is with Augustine. Augustine substituted the word for the meaning of the word field for church, when in fact Jesus said it is the world. Augustine had this idea of the visible and invisible church. The church is made up of believers and non-believers. There's people who go to church for cultural reasons or religious reasons who are not truly saved. That's not what Jesus said. The true church is only to be made up of the truly saved. It's the world that's made up of believers and non-believers. Why does God not destroy the world? Why does he not put an end to this evil? Well, if he did that, he'd have to put an end to the people in it. He's a God of mercy and salvation. I once had someone ask me in England, following the murder in Scotland, of uh, 11 school children in a place called Dunblane, that was like the Columbine of, of Great Britain, how could your God, if he's a God of love and a God of mercy, and who loves children, have allowed that man, David Hamilton, to have murdered those children? Why didn't your God do something about it? Why doesn't he put an end to evil? And I, I told him, first of all, you're blaming the wrong God. Jesus made it very clear that Satan is the God of this world. 
Don't blame my God for what your God did. I went on to explain to him, Don't worry, the Son of Man came that the works of Satan will be destroyed. My God is going to get rid of the God of this world. My God is going to destroy evil. But why doesn't he do it today? Well, if he did, he'd have to destroy you with it. But he's giving you a chance to repent and be born again. He's giving you a chance to believe the gospel and to get saved. That's why Jesus does not put an end to evil now. He may put an end to individual evils, but he will put an end to evil in its total sense when the crop permits, when the full number of those to be saved has been saved. It's a variable. Now there is in fact another aspect of why it is a variable. It is what we might call the Sodom effect. The Sodom effect. Well, you get the Jewish teaching of the Minyan. Can you even find ten righteous? Abraham pleads on behalf of Sodom where Lot lives. Can you find me fifty righteous? If you find fifty righteous, will you destroy it? God says no. Can you find me forty? No. Can you find me thirty? No. Well, the last days, the same thing happens. The faithful remnant, the people who are righteous and who really love Jesus, become so small, there's not enough salt to preserve anymore. God will simply intervene on behalf of those who are his, rescue them, and then turn against the others. So on one side, it is wickedness. Wickedness hastens his coming. Wickedness hastens his coming. Wickedness hastens his coming. On the other hand, righteousness causes him to tarry. Righteousness causes him to tarry. What we have today, even among people who profess to be evangelicals, who are against prophecy, and who ridicule other believers who believe in end-time prophecy, what they're saying is, you're going to make these events a self-fulfilling prophecy. By you teaching about the Middle East and about Israel and these things, you, you want these things to happen. You want disaster to come so Jesus will come. We're supposed to be preserving the world, not destroying it if we're Christian. <laughs> In fact, by them ignoring prophecy, they're the ones who are exasperating and catalyzing the destruction. <laughs> so on one hand, through righteousness, through people actually being saved, through people coming to faith in Jesus, we can actually make the Lord tarry. But it's an intimity. The same process also makes him come faster. Just think of eating or breathing. If something is being oxidized, something else is being reduced. If you want to die, breathe. <laughs> Oxygen is a histological toxin, it'll kill you. If you want to die, eat. But then to convert the food, the carbon to energy, requires oxygen. Works through Krebs cycle. Eat and you'll die. Breathe and you'll die. You want to die faster? Don't eat. Don't breathe. <laughs> Well, that's quite a situation. Condemned if you do, condemned if you don't. That's the way the fallen world is. Ultimately, because of sin, and because it's in the domain of Satan, the human race in its present form, and man's habitat, is banned no matter what it does. It's under the domain of Satan. You want to die? Breathe. You want to die faster? Stop breathing. You want to die? Eat. You want to die faster? Stop. It's a lose-lose. Unless, of course, Jesus enters the situation and becomes the overriding factor in the equation. We've explained a number of times how prophecy really works and how what's popularly taught in seminaries is not in agreement with what the scripture says about prophecy. We've explained, seminaries and so forth, they will teach either
Frontierism. Historicism. Poemicism. Or futurism. The preterists say it already happened. It has no future meaning. Don't worry about the book of Revelation. Don't worry about the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. Those things happened in 70 AD. They have no future meaning. There are, in fact, two kinds of preterists. There are the liberal preterists, theologically liberal, who are unsaved, who don't believe anything. And then there are people who claim to be Christian who are preterists. They say it all happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed in fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus and Daniel. Well, there is no doubt, as we know, that the events of 70 AD fulfill prophecy, and they are a shadow or a type of the end. They're a partial fulfillment. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus did not separate the sheep from goats in 70 AD. Also, he made it very clear that nothing as bad as the Great Tribulation ever happened before, nor would anything so terrible happen again. The absolute fact is that worse things have happened both to the Jews and to the church since 70 AD. What happened to the Jews in the second century and the Bar Kokhba's rebellion was worse than what happened in 70 AD in the first century. More Christians have been killed in the last 75 years than of all recorded Christian history. As we speak, one out of ten saved Christians in the world is being persecuted for their faith, either in China or mainly Islamic countries, in the so-called religion of peace and tolerance that we're continually hearing about is peaceful and tolerant, even though the politicians who tell us this lie cannot show you a single Islamic country that is either peaceful or tolerant. They can't give you one Muslim country where Christians or Jews have the same rights they have in America or Europe or Britain or Israel. But one out of ten Christians is being persecuted even tonight. Quite a thing. But worse things have happened both to the Jews and the church since 70 AD. No. That preterism is wrong. However, there was a kind of preterism that did work, and it is biblical. Speaking in Matthew 24, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus made reference to Hanukkah, to the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Predicted by Daniel, it happened 160 years earlier. Jesus knew it happened because he celebrated Hanukkah in John chapter 10, which the New Testament calls the Feast of Dedication. Yet it has to happen again in the future, because he said so. It had a double meaning. In other words, Jesus took something that already happened and said it's going to happen again. It's doubly referenced. That kind of preterism is true. Yes, it already did happen, but it has a future meaning. Then there's historicism. The Protestant reformers, apart from Luther, liked historicism. They said, don't look for a specific antichrist or a specific scenario of end time events. These things are ongoing truths throughout history. Every pope is an antichrist. The pope is the antichrist. That's what they said. Don't look for any specific thing of the end of the age. Well, again, they were partly right. Let's go back again, as we always do, to Jesus' example of the abomination of desolations, the Shikutsa Meshomen. Yes, it did happen 160 years earlier, but in 70 AD, as Josephus records, the Romans put pagan incense on the Temple Mount, where the Holies of Holies had been, and began worshipping it. In the second century, the Emperor Hadrian built the temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount, in the city of Avalina Capitolina, as he renamed Jerusalem, and there was another abomination. In the 4th century, into the 5th century, Julian the Apostate, Constantine's nephew, attempted to rebuild the temple in order to reverse the words of Jesus, that not one stone would be thrown down upon another. He wanted to prove Jesus wrong, and all these mysterious fires happened. Well, there was another abomination. Today, on the Dome of the Rock, known sometimes as the Mosque of Omar, you'll see a quotation from the Koran, 
God has no son. Allah is not begotten, neither is he begin. Now, 1 John tells us denying the father-son relationship is a sure hallmark of Antichrist. Islam is an Antichrist religion. And if you've been to Israel and if you've seen the Mosque of Omar, you've seen the marble slab on the facade with the satanic face on it. It's there for a reason. I'm convinced. And the quotation from the Quran is right above it. There's an abomination of desolation on the Temple Mount now. Well, there's another one coming. In some sense, historicism is correct. Then there's polemicism. This was the view of choice of the Lutherans. If you go to a Lutheran seminary, they'll favor polemicism. Luther didn't like the book of Revelation because he didn't understand it. He basically rejected it as being canonical even. Same as he rejected the epistle of James because he didn't understand it. Well, it's only poetry to encourage the church during times of persecution. <laughs> that's what he said. And that's what Lutherans believe. Uh, classical Lutherans. Well, it has no future meaning. Well, in fact, John did write the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos during the persecution of the Emperor Domitian. It was given for that purpose. There's a truth in it, but it's not the whole truth. Then there is futurism. People who believe these events of the book of Revelation, of Matthew 24 and 25, of Luke 21, Mark 13, of Zechariah, Ezekiel, and so forth, have an end time meaning. The church, depending on what seminary you go to, will teach one of the four. If you go to an interdenominational seminary, they'll teach all four and let you make up your own mind. <laughs> Biblically, all four are simultaneously true. All four are simultaneously true. They are not mutually exclusive. What happened is, the church has replaced a Hebraic worldview, a Hebraic mindset of the Jewish minds of the first century who wrote the scripture and replaced it with a Hellenistic mindset, a Greek mindset that says only one of the four can be true, when in fact all four are simultaneously true. Yeah, those events of 70 AD do prefigure what's going to happen. It did fulfill it, but not totally. There are many antichrists throughout history. There are many abominations of desolation. Historicism is true. Oh yes, it's given to encourage us at times of persecution. That's why Revelation was written. That's why we have prophecy. That's also true. But all these things have a future meaning. Worldviews. Worldviews. So you have, first of all, the Greek worldview. The Greek worldview goes from Alpha to Omega. It is linear. Everything is progressing towards the eschaton towards the parousia, towards the return of Jesus. That's how the Western world sees human history. The Eastern world is different. The Eastern world has a circular view of history. The four seasons, it gets dark, then it gets light, then it gets dark again. You go from winter to spring, spring to summer, summer to autumn, then the cycle repeats again. A circular worldview. Reincarnation, shamanism, Hinduism. Those people see things in a circular sense. The ancient Canaanites believed that Baal rose from the dead every spring. Circular, circular, circular. So you have the Western worldview, the Hellenistic one, the Occidental worldview, and then we have the Eastern worldview. We have the Oriental one. Those are the two worldviews. East is East and West is West, as Rudyard Kipling commented. But there's a third 
worldview. The third worldview is the biblical worldview, the scriptural worldview that came from the ancient Hebrews and from the Jewish writers of the New Testament. It is neither Western nor is it Eastern. It's something very different. How does it work? Just think of the map of the Middle East. It's where three continents come together. Europe, Africa, and Asia. At the center of the Middle East, at the center of the Levant, is Israel. So the Middle East is the center of the world, and Israel is at the center of the center. God takes Abraham and brings him into biblical Israel. Through Abraham, all the tribes, all the people of the earth would be blessed. The gospel would come through the seed of Abraham. Salvation would come from the seed of Abraham. The scriptures would be composed by the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hence, Jesus comes, brings salvation, and the gospel spreads from Israel. It spreads to the east by historical record. St. Thomas, for instance, brings it to India. It spreads to the south by historical record. St. Matthew brings it to Ethiopia, to black Africa. And it spreads to the north and west. Paul, Barnabas, and so forth bring it to Europe. It goes in every direction because God put the Hebrews at the center of the world, at the center of the center, so the gospel could spread in every direction. It is neither east nor west. If you went to Israel today, it would be a curious place. It would geographically be in the east, but it would culturally be neither east nor west. It would be sort of like Japan or Singapore. They're eastern countries, yet they're westernized countries. You couldn't really call a place like Singapore, a western country, because it's an eastern country. But neither could you call it an eastern country because the economy, culture, social organization is westernized. It's both east and west. Despite the fact that it's located in the east, it's really as much west as it is east. Well, Israel is the same. You can just stand in Jerusalem outside Damascus Gate and you will see something that could be seen out of the scriptures. You'll see people with camels and donkeys. You'll see oriental merchants. You'll sniff the fragrances of perfumes and incense and spices with the flavor of the Orient. You'll see blind beggars, religious hypocrites. You'll see something that is very much an Eastern Oriental world. You can go less than one mile away and you will see commercial office blocks. You'll see high-rise apartment blocks of glass and steel. If you didn't notice the electric signs, you could just as well be in a shopping mall outside of Chicago or you could just as well be in Melbourne, Australia, or somewhere else. And in fact, even the electric signs are both in Hebrew and in English. Some in Russian, some in Arabic, but everybody speaks English. How could it be both Eastern and Western? Well, it's always been like that. It's always been like that. It's Eastern and Western. So instead of an Eastern worldview, which is a circular view of human history, or a Greek worldview, which is a linear view of human history, let us understand the Hebraic biblical view. As in the Western worldview, you can have an Alpha and you have an Omega. And that 
is the eschaton. That is the parousia. However, something happens. Instead of a linear view, or instead of a circular view, we have something entirely different. Prophecy is not simply a prediction and a fulfillment, like in the Western world. It is a pattern. There are many antichrists. There are many abominations of desolation. Each one is a picture of the final one. We have a cyclical worldview. Prophecies have multiple fulfillments. There are many antichrists. Herod the Great was an antichrist. Herod the Tetrarch was an antichrist. Caesar Augustus was an antichrist. Throughout history, Joseph Stalin was an antichrist. Adolf Hitler was an antichrist. Napoleon Bonaparte was an antichrist. Both an antichrist. Many of them. Again, again, again. Can they behave in a similar character? But all of them teach about a final one. Oh, there's many abominations on the Temple Mount. So you're going from Alpha to Omega, there is a linear progression, but it's not a straight line. It's a combination of East and West. It's a combination of linear and circular. It is cyclical. Let's understand this further. So we have Alpha and Omega, the return of Jesus. We have a cyclical outworking of biblical prophecy. It works in cycles. Something that illustrates the relationship between direction that is trajectory. The path something takes is the trajectory, of course. And at the speed at which it travels in that direction, its velocity, and that which makes it travel, its activation, or energy of activation, is called a vector as every scientist, every physicist, particularly, and certainly every engineer or mathematician knows, it's a vector. They teach you vectors at first year of university or college. If you study mathematics or physics or engineering, everybody learns vectors their first year, the first semester. One of the first things they teach you is vectors. Ballistics is vectors. There was a mathematician who was an expert in geometry called Birkhoff and he used geometry to demonstrate that pocket billiards and pool <laughs> vectors. Rocket science is vectors. That's what rocket science really is, is vectors. Astronomy, astrophysics is vectors. Everything to do with the relationship between motion and direction and speed in time there's a vector. So we have the vector. 
In the vector, you can have miles per second. Miles per second. It's traveling this way at so many miles per second. But if you increase the energy of activation, you make it happen faster. So you go miles per second per second. And if you continue to increase the energy of activation, in other words, if it's a rocket, you're burning more fuel at, at a higher temperature, or if it's an internal combustion engine, you're, you're, you're burning more fuel more quickly, you're using fuel injection instead of a carburetor, it's going to go faster. All you're doing is increasing the energy of activation. You get an exponential growth in the velocity, then it goes miles per second per second. If you continue to increase the energy active of activation further, it goes miles per second per second, like a plane on takeoff, like a jet plane. The more you increase the energy of activation, not only the faster is it going to go, but the rate of increase in its speed. So in other words, from going from here to there, the closer I get there, the faster I go. The closer you get to omega, the faster you approach it. You begin here. The closer you get to the target, the faster you approach it by increasing the energy of activation. Now let's understand biblical prophecy. The first coming of Jesus is like the second coming. There are hundreds and hundreds of messianic prophecies about the first coming of Christ in Scripture. Hundreds. Hundreds. Most of these, however, were fulfilled in a 35-year period. Now when you consider the time from Abraham to Jesus was 2,000 years. God was preparing Israel for the first coming of Christ just as long as he's been preparing the church for the second coming of Christ. We think way back to the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, the book of Acts of the Apostles, 2,000 years God's been working. Well, you think to the Jews when he came the first time, they're thinking the same way back to Abraham. That's a long we don't normally look at it that way, but that's what the scripture tells us. That's what history tells us. So out of that 2,000 year period, most of those prophecies about the Messiah were fulfilled in 35 years, less than one generation. Most of those, however, were fulfilled in four years. So most of those prophecies that took place in a 35-year period were fulfilled in a period of four years, beginning with the birth of John the Baptist until the day of Pentecost. And then most of those prophecies were fulfilled in a six-and-a-half-day period. Most of those prophecies were fulfilled in less than a week. So, the vastly greatest percentage of all those hundreds of prophecies were fulfilled in 35 years. But the vastly greatest percentage of those were fulfilled in four years. And the greatest percentage of those were fulfilled in less than a week. The closer you get to the target, the faster you approach it. Like running into a wall and gaining momentum, gaining velocity, gaining speed as you approach the wall. That's about as far as you can go with calculating it or tabulating it mathematically. You can use mathematics to explain the way the vector works, but you can't quantify it to pinpoint the time of impact. Do you know what I'm saying? When you're going to actually reach the omega. 
There'll be people who are going to try to do that various ways. It will not work because of the variation in the cycles. There's no fixed pattern. There's a pattern, but the interim can vary in between fulfillments. Certain things have to happen before Jesus comes. Many of those things have already happened. Many of those things are continuing to happen as we speak tonight. Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948. Israel got back to Jerusalem in 1967. Jews began turning to Christ in significant numbers in the 1960s. Same time as Jerusalem was united. We see the nations of the earth coming increasingly against Israel. Israel is God's timepiece for the nations. You just think of it. One country in the Middle East that protects the human rights of Arab Christians is Israel. Yet they're the ones everybody wants to pick on, including many Christians, for violating human rights. It's not logical. What nation in the Middle East has the best record of human rights for women, for homosexuals, for everybody? Well, Israel. They're the one everybody wants to pick on, but they'll ignore Islam, which has the most abysmal record of human rights. And, of course, the, the media have no qualms about it. No qualms about it. Much of the church has no qualms about it. They'll just say things that are not only lies, but ridiculous lies. It's just the way it is. Well, what does the scripture say? The nations will come against Jerusalem to try to prevent the return of Christ. It's the hand of Satan. It won't work. These things are happening increasingly as we speak. Look how quickly things happen. The Jews go from refugees with a rag on their back out of concentration camps, and three years later they're back in their ancient homeland. And that's just Israel. Just look at Israel. Look how quickly the European Union is declining financially. Look how quickly America is being destroyed by its own government and its own, its own presidents. It's almost as if you're out to destroy the country. Uh, three years ago, three years ago, the national deficit of the United States was $160 billion. Three years later, it's $1.3 trillion. This is madness. It's like you're intentionally trying to crash the car. <laughs> how can you go from such power to such wealth? To this? How could this happen? We were just in Japan. That was the second biggest economy in the world when we were there, and the biggest economy in Asia. We were in Japan two months ago. In the last two months, China has overtaken Japan. It's the biggest economy in Asia, and it's the second biggest economy in the world, not Japan. Japan's public debt is 200% of gross domestic product. 200% of GDP is the public debt. How can that happen? Look at all the Subarus all over the world. How can this happen? <laughs> Stuff happens very quickly. But let's look at the church. If you told me 25 years ago, 25 years ago, that there'd be a tattooed goon, a criminally convicted pedophile, a homosexual pedophile, kicking old ladies in the face on television, and major Christian leaders like Peter Wagner and Rick Joyner were calling it a revival, that would have seemed crazy. That the same guy abandoned his wife and kids, runs off with a woman, and now they've restored him to ministry, and, and this, this woman he ran off with is now prophesying it. This would have seemed crazy 25 years ago. If you would have said 25 years ago, or even 20, that people would be reading a book called The Shack, written by somebody who's a non-Christian, 
who says that Jesus did not die for sin, and a God, a God that requires his son to atone for sin doesn't exist. That would be crazy to think born-again Christians would read such a book by somebody who fundamentally denies the gospel and who is obviously not a Christian by any biblical definition. It's the most popular selling book in the world among people who claim to be evangelical. Just look at the pace, the rate at which the disintegration has taken place. The rate at which the apostasy in the church has taken place. Major figures caught in all kinds of financial and sexual immorality, and they're back in the ministry. Does Ted Haggard, the Jim Baker, does it means nothing. We forget that less than a generation ago, this would have been unthinkable. Look how the divorce rate in 30 years that was almost negligible among saved Christians has become as high as the secular world among people professing to be evangelicals in less than 30 years. The rate at which these things happen, the closer you get to the omega point, the faster you approach it. On the negative side, the apostasy and immorality in the church, let alone the world, that is creating the Sodom effect. If it keeps going the way it's going, there'll be nothing to happen except the Lord to intervene and take out Lot and his family. That's all. This is not to say we should get into a bunker mentality. It's not to say that we should stop evangelizing. On the contrary, we should become more aggressive in warning people to repent that Jesus is coming. We should not have a bunker mentality until the time comes when the Lord closes the hand of the ark. On the other hand, the Sodom effect is certainly taking place. We can't stop the Sodom effect. We can warn the apostate churches. We can warn Christians who are in churches that have gone into the ecumenical movement or into the purpose-driven lie or whatever. We can warn them, but we can't stop it. We have to remember, God has given them over to it in judgment. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the Lord will send a delusion to make them believe what is false. Many of these people are given over to a spirit of error. David and I talk a lot about different people we witness to and try to evangelize. And David always uses the example, how can you tell a blind man to read this if he's blind? Unless it's braille, he can't read it. Here, here, look at Isaiah chapter 7. He can't read it. He's blind. I know Jewish people who are blind. Not simply blind, but willfully blind. So God gives them over to blindness. Look, can't you see the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed? I had a prominent rabbi in New York debating me once. He couldn't deny what Daniel 9 said. He just said, give me a better source than Daniel. He was, not simply, he was simply not blind, but he was willfully blind. I showed Catholic people. Look, Mary says she needed to be saved from sin. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. Your baby, the Messiah, would save his people from their sin. Can't you see Mary said she had sin? Even though Mary said it. Oh, Mormons don't believe that God was Adam. Even Brigham Young said God was Adam. <laughs> Can't you see that the, your, your own leader, your own follower, you go around with t-shirts in Utah saying Brigham Young said it, that settles it, I believe it. Well, he said that this was, that Adam was God. Oh, we don't, oh, can't you see it contradicts what you claim to believe? When people are willfully blind, God gives them over to their blindness and judgment. You can't help being blind. We're all blind, like a baby is biologically born blind. Because of sin, because we're born into a fallen race, we're all blind. 
the Lord opens the eyes of the blind when they become believers in Jesus, they see. But that's an unwillful blindness. What happens when people go into a willful blindness? God makes them blind in judgment. We can't stop the Sodom effect. We can warn people, but that's all. We can't do anything but that. But what we can do is what Peter said. We can hasten his coming. Think of it. And the prop permits. We can hasten his coming. It is actually possible for us to make Jesus come back sooner. Now again, you have these lunatic fringe cranks who are saying, you're making prophecy of the apocalypse, a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you're going to make it happen by trying to say these things are going to happen instead of trying to prevent disaster, you're trying to promote them. The opposite is true. If people believed these things and repented and recognized prophecy, that's the only thing that could make the Lord tarry. That's the only thing that could delay the inevitable destruction. But as it is, the Sodom effect is hastening the destruction. What can we hasten? Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3 once again. Verse 11, since these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and elements will melt with intensity. What we can hasten is our rescue. It was not Lot and his family who caused the fire and brimstone to come on Sodom. It was the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Had the people repented, it would have delayed. It wasn't Lot. Lot was rescued. I'm not looking for destruction to come upon the planet. What I am looking forward to is being rescued or seeing the faithful church rescued before the destruction comes. Now let's understand this once more. What was the ultimate trigger that made Sodom and Gomorrah happen. Middle? Radical? Militant homosexuality and sexual perversion. Something which was unnatural and perverse <coughs> became their social, cultural, and probably religious norm. It became the norm. Something that is non-reproductive, something that uh, does not occur among any of the primates, something that uh, is medically dangerous, but it becomes their norm. It becomes their norm. San Francisco, it's their norm. And of course, if you say it's wrong and warn them, you're not only called a homophobe, you're called a bigot, you're the bad guy. They're going to turn against faithful Christians like they turned against Lark. <laughs> the problem is, you're going to have the Tony Campolas of this world and the Brian McLarens of this world who are going to compromise with homosexuality. You're going to have, and we already have, the Rick Warrens of this world who went on CNN after he originally opposed same-sex marriage, changing his view on Proposition 8. The, the apostate church is going to go along with this stuff. The apostate church will go along with this stuff. And they're going to get more and more violent, vehement, towards those who don't. 
they'll get more influence in the positions of government. People will try to look for political solutions, but forget about that. Who was this judge who just outlawed Proposition 8, even though the voters voted for it? He just outlawed it at the stroke of a pen. Who was he? A homosexual judge. Who nominated him to the bench? Ronald Reagan. Who appointed him to the bench? George Bush. This is a Republican. There's no political redemption. There's no political salvation. None. None. And as in Sodom, it's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse. But as in Sodom, there will be a rescue. It's getting closer and closer. Faster and faster. Despite the fact that homosexuals and lesbians have a reduced longevity statistically, they're allowed to adopt. Now normally, you want to adopt children, you're screened for all kinds of things, including your own health. <laughs> we don't want these kids being orphaned again. Are you RH negative or RH positive? You can't ask those questions of a homosexual. <coughs> They have the right to adopt. You want to buy medical insurance in California? Because of the homosexual lobby, you can't ask if somebody is HIV, positive or negative. Therefore, the people who are not HIV, positive or negative, have to pay higher premiums. Because you're not allowed to ask people who are if they're HIV positive. You understand it's a discrimination in favor of homosexuals and lesbians against other people. And it's going to get worse. People try to stop it, doesn't matter. That, that is hastening the judgment of God. Because of these things, the wrath of God will come. To bring kids up in that, to bring, take the baby and bring them up, that, that will hasten the judgment of God. On the other hand, we're trying to hasten something else. The rescue of God. We are trying to hasten the rescue of God. This is the energy of activation. Just think, if you want to make an old steam locomotive go faster, you have to shovel more coal faster. Forget about the stoker, supplement the stoker with the sh <coughs> The more faithful we are in doing the work of Jesus and proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming his return, the faster he's going to return. It's when the crop permits. We are going to come to a time, the same as his first coming, when a lot of things, a lot of things, are going to happen in a very short period of time. One of which, of course, is Daniel 10. Iran is going to emerge in biblical prophecy, in conflict with Europe, and as a threat to Israel. What's happening? Daniel chapter 10 is happening. Happening very quickly. Overnight. And those nations and the confederation of nations in constellation with each other against Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Turkey had to be there. Well, Turkey was always a friend of the West, and Turkey was westernized and a friend of Israel. Look at it now. Look how quickly it turned. Look how quickly it happened. Look how quickly Bush and Obama dragged America down. And of course, nations get the leaders they deserve. Not just blaming the politicians. We get the leaders we deserve, like in the book of <coughs> Kings and Chronicles. Look how quickly televangelists destroyed the credibility of the church. Look how quickly the money preachers destroyed our credibility. It's so difficult to witness to people now. They think getting saved is a kind. Look how quickly. It all happens very 
and it's going to happen more quickly still. Every day we get closer to the return of Jesus. Every day we get closer to his return. We approach his return even faster. What can we do about it? Ironically, it is the same solution. If you want to delay the judgment of God, see people repent and get saved. If you want to hasten the return of Christ, evangelize and see people repent and get saved. It's, like, it's quite a thing. Call on intimidate. You want to die, breathe. You want to die faster, stop breathing. You want to die, eat. If you want to die faster, stop. <laughs> That's the way it is. You want Jesus to come? Witness. Make disciples. You want to delay the wrath of God from coming? Witness. Make disciples. We can only understand and explain these things up to a certain point. Mr. Tesla did not know how to explain alternating current. He just knew it was true and it worked. I don't know how to explain end time prophecy beyond the point I just did. What I do know is it's true and it works. That's what happened when he came the first time. That's what's going to happen when he comes again. It is the vector. God bless. Dear friends, greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, 
all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.